All right, welcome back to a season-ending wrap-up of Grizz Talk from Hillsball Camp. I'm here with men's basketball coach Greg Campy. Coach, thanks for joining us here. It's a little quiet in the background, but that's that's how every season ends, right? Yeah, it's been a long season, though. I mean, if you really look at it, it's the latest that we've ever played. Not only we've ever played, that any Summit League team in its history has ever played, you know, going into the Sunday of, of uh, Elite Eight. We figured out there were only 12 teams still playing, still practicing and playing. So it was, and don't forget, we started in August because we went to uh, Canada this year. So mm -hmm. it was really a long season. I think there was a, a lot of tired people that last 10 minutes of the game. It kind of got away from us. And it, you, could, you, you know, we got to that point where you knew we weren't going to win and you could just see the, you know, the altitude and the length of the season and all that kind of come out of us in the last 10 minutes. We were trying, but our legs weren't going anywhere. So um, sad that it's over because it turned out to be a pretty special year. How would you summarize the season? Well, I think it was a season of ebbs and flows or ups and downs, a roller coaster type ride that um, a good young team would have. And you know, it's an interesting team because it was a, you talk about youth, and we played four freshmen, two sophomores, a junior, and two seniors. And it was a gap a transition year when we lost Ilya during the during the summertime I think that really changed not only the outlook for our team but it really changed the makeup of their team of as far as experience and youth we were going to go from a team that was going to be kind of young but enough veteran pieces to I think you know do something special to a team that was I mean blatantly we're just young and it still it reared its head in the in the Utah State game in that you know, our physical size in the post, we couldn't guard their post player. He'd just, he'd just get the ball, and we position was good and everything. He'd lower that shoulder, and he'd just knock us closer and closer to the basket. And when we tried to double, because, we, because of that, we tried to double. When we went to double, we left guys open for threes, and they made everything. Yeah, and then, they did have a pretty good shooting game. Yeah, and then we, we decided to guard the three and leave the young kid on his own. And... You know, he gave up baskets. Their, their post player had 18 points, and and I think he was <laughs> seven to seven from the floor or something like that. But you know, so so that youth reared its ugly head there in that game, um, and again, not having Ilya changed that. So saying that, how did the year go? Well, I, I think we had a really good year. You know, we've done something that that uh, nobody ever did before, and whenever you do something like that, that's pretty good. Uh, started out good. I think we had excitement. Uh, with all the youth, and then we went through that span at, at, around Christmas time where we lost six in a row. And uh, what I was very proud of is that we pulled ourselves out of that and we finished our conference season strong. Now the schedule was kind of in our favor to do that, and we knew that all along with the young team. That was something we were really excited that our schedule. We still had to go out and do it. Right. Our schedule was favorable, but we did it, and we went into the league tournament. And I thought we were poised to win the league tournament. I really did. I thought we were had peaked. We were playing our best basketball, and the postseason ended up proving that. But then a freak thing happened. And I mean, you can't explain what happened in that Utah, uh, Southern Utah game. The, the last two minutes, have an 11-point lead. Southern Utah played a great basketball game, and we took their shots, and we got out to a double-digit lead. We made 15 and 27 from the three. We played great basketball, and then with two minutes, two and a half minutes to go. You know, weird things happen in this game, and they happen to everybody. They happen to great teams, bad teams, average teams, and it happened. We picked ourselves up off the ground and had a great postseason and made a great run in that tournament. So, you know, I'll remember this year as a year that, that we were could have easily taken a major step back, and we didn't. We held our ground. We got the 20 wins. We went to postseason. It, it, it wasn't. We didn't meet the mission of the team or the mission of the program. Uh, but we poised and we put ourselves in position that the next couple years we've got a chance to be really, really good again. What, the, what was the biggest key in that turnaround after the six-game streak? Well, I just think that we started making shots. We really struggled to shoot the ball at times in the year, early in the year. I'll give you a perfect example. Dante Williams um, is a kid that we recruited because we thought he was a pretty good shooter and he was a nice guy. He made six threes in the state championship game. Um, and during the year, he just couldn't make shots, and he was given opportunity after opportunity. Not only was he not making them, he was, if he hit the rim sometimes, that was good, you know. I mean, he, he probably shot four or five consecutive. He came around at the end of the season. Well, that's my team. point. That's yeah. my point. At the end of the year, 
in, in practice and in the games. He, he made two threes against Utah State, and the two shots he missed were three quarters of the way down the rim and came and popped out. And in practice, even more, you know, we took him, where he was flirty, starting and flirting with playing time and that, and we finally just said, okay, and we put him on the scout team, and he relaxed, and he grew, and he got better, and then he really helped the team. And that's why that tournament was so important to us. So the fact that we shot the ball so poorly and ended up being a really good shooting team, I, I think, 11 or 12 of our last 13 games, we made double-digit threes. Right. Uh, is that frustrating, speaking of Dante, watching a kid uh, struggle in the games who does really well in practice and just not yeah. see carryover? Yeah, I think, I think Dante had a freshman year that was kind of weird in that, you know, we went to Canada and he was so good in Canada, he averaged six, seven points a game. And then he got into the games and I don't know, you know, fear or trying to understand the game, trying to learn his role. Maybe the game was a little too fast for him. Um, you know, he want, Dante's a great kid. He wanted to do well, and he pressed and pressed. And, and at the end, he got it figured out. And I, I think Dante's got a tremendous future. And, you know, this is a big summer for him. It's a big summer for Petros. It's a big summer, summer for Zagora. It's a big summer for uh, um, Poaches. Those four kids this summer and what happens next year with you know, the recruits coming in uh, for their careers and how they're going to help us, the, the, what they do in this offseason is huge. But going back to Dante, you know, the, the scalings, he has no ceiling in my mind. With his athleticism, he can shoot the ball, he can run, he's got to get bigger. He's definitely and shown flashes of what he's capable of. Yeah, and, he, and he's got to get bigger. And so all four of those guys have got to get bigger and stronger. And, our emphasis, you're probably going to ask me this later, but now that I'm on it, uh, our emphasis this offseason is not in the gym, it's in the weight room. This, this, this team was, you could see just looking at us that we didn't look like Oakland teams in the past. We weren't big and strong, which has kind of been our calling card. And, you know, I played that off as, well, we're so young, all these freshmen, and I think I made a mistake there. I think that, you know, we did not get it done in the weight room prior to the beginning of this season. What do you think may have contributed to that, just having guys in place already that knew what, what was expected in the off season? Well, yeah, and I think that, you know, when you win like we've won, you become complacent in you don't want to change things. This is how this team was doing it, and they're comfortable with it, and we, we're winning, and we're winning big. So even though those young kids are in there and you're thinking, you know, God, we got to get them in the weight room. We do, but maybe we didn't emphasize it enough or whatever. I know that it it was a glaring fact with this team that we were not physically strong enough and big enough. Um, that being said, what was your best memory of this season? The best memory of the season? Um, I know what it's probably not. But what would it not be? <laughs> the, southern, the end of the Southern Utah game. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that might be one of my worst memories in life. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably wake up 15 years from now and, and uh, sweating and saying, did, we really, did that really just happen? Um, I think seeing the growth of the team is, is the best memory. I think um, seeing them come back from the losing streak and rebuilding themselves. And, you know, we live by that creed that we always chant and talk about. And, and in that creed, we talk about, you know, I'm never out of the fight. I'll never quit. If knocked down, I'll get up every time. And I think that team, this team got knocked down, and, and they got up every time. Do you have any particular favorite plays? Maybe Reggie's winner at Valpo, or uh, I know Lavelle had a hanging reverse lay-in I was pretty fond of in the Michigan game. Do you have any of those? Yeah, I mean, Bass is dunk in the, in the uh, was that Rice? Or I think was it was it? maybe Buffalo. The, the Buffalo game, game. yeah, I think like it was 22. the Buffalo game, yeah. That dunk, and only because we knew he could do it, and he had two or three times this year that he had the opportunity to do it, and he didn't. And one of those times, somebody came in and blocked it, you know, his lap, and I, I was pretty upset with him. I could get upset once in a while um, that he didn't go up and punch it down. And then when he did, I think that play, and you know, I, I think Bader's, uh, the South Dakota State game when Bader uh, went off from the three-point line and showed the world what kind of a shooter he is. And, and the game at Valpo, I think beating the Horizon League champion on the road and uh, in the fashion that we did it, where we were down 17 and Reggie just took the game over. 
And then I think I'd be remiss not to point out that Reggie scored 940 points in one season. 940 points. I mean, 940 points. What uh, I, I was looking at the scoring <laughs> champions. Jimmer last year was the, the yeah. first person to score a thousand in you know eons back right. since like Glenn Robinson, I think. Right, and I just 940 is pretty high. Nine. Days. I mean, you you put people in the Hall of Fame that score a thousand in their career, and this young man scored, and he did it within the function of the team. You know, I've had a couple big time scorers that I would make me pull my hair out. You know, people think this is fake, but uh, you know, it's it's real. And every once in a while, those the follicles have had time yes. to like regenerate since then. <laughs> but you know, because you know, those scores like Reggie have this mentality: I gotta go, I gotta go. And Reggie didn't have that mentality. Did he? Did he hold the ball a little too long sometimes? Yeah, but he did that, and then bam, he'd make great plays. You know, he had he he went out with 23 points, which is well below you know his average of 26, which is amazing. But he went out with nine assists in, the, in his last game, and and he had three turnovers, and two of them were charges. So and neither one of them were charges, but they were called charges. Um, so you know the memory of that kid in the season, and that has to be a tough thing. You know when when you're you 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 win like we won, and then all those guys are gone, and here you are left with. Bader and Valentine and, and rookies, and he handled it really well. He really, really handled it well and had a great senior season. Now, that being said, with everything, how it all turned around, but do you, do you have anything that you would change about the season or anything that you, I guess, would do differently going back? Well, the first thing I would have done is I wouldn't have let Ilya go home to <laughs> last summer. He'd been here for four years, and he wanted to go home, and I allowed him to go home, and he got there, and the agents there like sharks got to him, <laughs> and it's hard. He had his degree. Took him to the dark side. Right, he had his degree. If he hadn't had his degree, I'm sure he would have come back, but he had his degree, and now they're throwing money at him. So, you know, I wouldn't have let him go home. That would have been the first thing. And the second thing that I would have changed is that our summer program last summer, would have we would have done more testing and more, um, you know, prove to me you're in the way room, prove to me you're getting bigger and stronger. And, you know, what we've done is we've already hired a strength coach this year who is only going to work with men's and women's basketball. So we've gone out and we've remedied this, that we've got a guy that's going to be uh, making sure that, that this doesn't happen again. So, you know, those are about the only two things that come to my mind. I think the team, I think, the t I think it was a really good year. Was it a year that we'll talk about? Yeah, it's a year that we'll talk about. This is a team that will be remembered. Is it the greatest year in Oakland history? No. I mean, is it the greatest team? No. But it's a team that will be remembered and will be talked about. Um, on the subject of Reggie playing next year, uh, what do you think of his chances going pro? Um, surely Europe, what, what about even the NBA? Well, you know, it's interesting. The All-American team came out and he didn't make it. And I, I mean, I'm shocked by that. that the other, nation's leading scorer the, the, the wouldn't even get an honorable mention. The nation's leading scorer, and not only is the nation's leading scorer, he's he's done it in a. I mean, he, like he scored thirty some points on sixteen shots. I mean, he he's done it without hogging the ball. Um, he's led a young team. He, you know, he was the Naismith Player of the Year for f under six feet. He all those things. And then he, you know, so sometimes I think Reggie gets overlooked a little bit. And uh, so, will that happen in the NBA? No, I think he's going to be given a chance. And what I mean by that is everybody knows that Reggie Hamilton can score the ball. Everybody knows that. Every pro scout knows that. They know he's a unique scorer. The question for the NBA is size. He doesn't have that NBA body with the length and the 6'4 and that. All right. And then the second thing is how can he defend? Can he go out and defend the guy that is 6'4 and, you know, Think of the great point guards in the NBA. Can he guard them? And so he's going to have to prove that. The good thing is that he is on their radar. So he's going to Portsmouth at the beginning of the month. He is. Uh, he'll get into a lot of NBA workouts where you know the teams will call him in and they'll work him out. And then the, how he does in those areas will determine whether he gets drafted or not. Why do you think he may get overlooked? Well, I think that. You know, Morrison had a great year in our league, and Nate Walders, his name is, you know, they went to Washington and beat Washington by 20-some points, and, 
and the coach at Washington made a statement after the game that Nate Walters is the next Steve Nash. And that kind of spread through the media like wildfire. And, and, and well deserved, very well deserved. But I, I just wonder when the last time the leading scorer in the nation wasn't the MVP of his league or didn't make some type of All-American team. So I know Reggie made the mid-major All-American team. But the, you know, the, the big one, I'm, I'm surprised by all that. Another Oakland alum playing in the NBA, Keith Benson, finally got called up to the Golden State Warriors. Have you uh, caught a Warriors game yet? No, I haven't seen it because we've been, you know, I just got back at 2.30 this morning. The game was Sunday. Can you imagine if we would have won and had to play here tomorrow? And because of the travel, we didn't get back until 2.30 in the morning. I walked in my house at 2.30. Um, it was unbelievable. But So I haven't had a chance to, to see any of the games. I've paid attention to it, though. Um, we knew it was a matter of time. We knew once he got in the D League. And it, the, the thing with Benson is you got to know Keith. You've got to be around him, and you've got to experience the Benson effect. And what I mean by that is every, all our fans know, you know, he's not the most outgoing kid in the world. He's not an emotional... Emotion. He opened up by senior, by his senior year. He had yeah. opened up a little bit, but yes. I but emotion doesn't flow out of him. <laughs> and if you don't know him and you're a coach who's making millions of dollars and your whole life is based on, you know, you got to come out here and you got to play hard and you got to do all that. And you see this kid that's, you know, um, you're, you're going to cast him aside because you, my life depends on you playing your tail off. And, and once Keith got around, and he got to Sioux Falls, and he got to play a bunch of games, and his numbers kept going up, and he, be, you know, and he's a double double this, and he's a double double machine, and he, but he's got to be given the opportunity to do it, and I think what happened is they needed the Sioux Falls was not winning much, they, and so he got that opportunity, and the coach got around this laissez-faire attitude that Keith has, and it's just, it's not an attitude, it's just, it's, it's his presence, it's who he is. And when they saw that he does care and he does play hard and he's really good, you know, they, oh, there, go, Keith. And now that it permeated up into the NBA. And so somebody, I mean, he's 6'11 and he can score. So, you know, he's, he's got a chance. And I heard he's, he played four minutes in each of the games. I heard one of the games get a couple of rebounds, blocked a shot or something like that. So he just needs opportunity. And if Keith will get opportunity in the NBA, he'll have a long career in the NBA. Now, speaking of Oakland moving forward, who do you think is going to be, who's going to surprise fans the most next year? Is it going to be Ryan Bass, you think, or is that, did he let the, the rabbit out of the, out of that secret out of the bag? I, don't, I can't think of that phrase. It escapes me right now. Did he let the secret out at the, toward the end of this year? Um, Bass? I, I admit, I'm not a wordsmith with the phrases like you are. You're supposed to be a journalist now. Um, I have time to think about it when I write. Yeah, that's true. Bass is going to be a score. That. I, you know how I try and take players and, and compare them to people I know from my past now. Bass is Vinnie Johnson. And the young people here, our students probably don't know who Vinnie Johnson is, but in the late 80s, Pistons won two straight championships and they had a kid named Vinnie Johnson who was small, strong. Even when he was young, I don't think people would call him a kid. He always looked pretty old. Yeah. Well, but Vinnie, Vinnie would go in the game and they'd give him the ball, and everybody'd get out of his way, and he'd shoot it. And if the ball was going in, he'd get you 20, 25, and if the ball wasn't, they'd take him out. And I really look at, you know, that's where Bass's role is on this team. I do would like to see it expanded a little bit because he is such a good defender and a rebounder. But, you know, that's, that's going to be his next step to be able to exp expand his role. He got an opportunity this year, and he, he seized the opportunity. He went from a point guard that was going to be a backup to a starter at the two, at five foot one or whatever he is. All right, and he proved to me that he can play that position. Now, the best thing that Bass has going for him is Duke Monday, because we're going to have a point guard at six four. Does he count as a surprise? I mean, I guess people aren't familiar with him yet, so that could be a surprise. Well, nobody knows what he can do they, unless you've come and sat in and watched our practices and seen Duke Monday play. You have no idea. What we've got is a six foot, well, we're talking about that, that NBA body, and like, he is that what they want. And I'm not saying he's an NBA player and he's that talented. I'm saying physically, he's that prototype NBA point guard. He's got the long arms, he's strong, he's big at 6'4. And uh, 
So that's going to help Bass because if you have a 6-4 point, you can play a 5-7, five, 5-8, five, whatever Bass is, 5-9, two guard. Um, but we also, if you take Bass out of the equation as a starter and look at him as that spark plug off the bench, you know, there's a very, very good chance that we're going to start. Uh, and if, 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 if we open tonight with next year's team, we would probably start Duke Monday at the point at 6-4. Uh, Bader at the two at six five, and then Dante Williams at six six, and Valentine at six five, and then Petros at six ten. You know, so we're looking at a six four through six ten long athletic lineup with coming off the bench with you know Lloyd Neely maybe the incoming freshman who's had a tr tremendous career at six foot five six foot six. Poaches is six four. You know, Bass is, you know, we already discussed his role, you know, and I'm sure maybe he'll be a starter and we won't be that big, but we have the makeup of being a really long and athletic team and a team that I think could, could be possibly one of the best defensive teams we've ever coached because what Duke Monday brings to the table is an unbelievable defensive presence. He led the Big East. He led the Big East in steals. And night in and night out, the competition in our league is not what the Big East is. So if he can do that in the Big East, I'm wondering what he'll do in our league. The chaos and the havoc, the mayhem that he can cause. What do you see happening in the Summit League next year? Well, I think that South Dakota State's going to be picked to win it. I mean, they finished second this year. They won the league tournament. And they have everybody back but Griffin Callahan, who is a good player, but you know, he's a replaceable player. Um, all players are replaceable, but I'm sure that their coach there is, you know, he'll go on and we'll have another, you know, glue and glue guy, which Callahan was. So I think that they'll be probably, I would guess they'll be a unanimous pick to win the league. And then I think you'll see North Dakota State will be picked second. I think you'll see uh, Western Illinois will be picked third and will probably be picked fourth. And I think you'll see that because Nobody knows about Duke Monday. They have, you know, all they do, they look at us and say, well, Reggie was, you know, Reggie averaged 26 points. Where are they going to score? They're going to lose that. And I'm sure some of our fans are feeling the same way, that they're, what are we going to do? You know, well, Reggie was a stopgap. Once, I never really, I talked so much, I forgot to finish when we were talking about Ilya going in the summer. But, you know, Reggie took a team of freshmen and helped us get to their sophomore year and, and now that we're in our sophomore year, we're going to wave goodbye to Reggie. Thank you. But we're, we expect to be better. We expect, our expectation here will be to win this, the league championship. And our expectation will be to be back in the NCAA tournament. And everybody here believes that's going to happen. So even though we'll probably be, be picked fourth, I just think you know, people aren't going to know who Duke Monday is. And, and then the natural, natural progression of our bigs getting better. Our, if you look at Petros's and Sikora's numbers, they are way better than Benson and Hudson at that stage. At, after their freshman year. We all remember what Benson and Hudson were when they dominated the league, but we don't remember back when they were freshmen. And you know, That's another guy, Will Hudson, who's doing really well for himself professionally too. Um, Benson and Hudson, were they forced to play? Did they get as much playing time as freshmen? Hudson did not. Hudson. Uh, we had some other bigs, Waterstrad, and you know, so Hudson didn't get as much. Now Benson started as a freshman until the second to last game of the season. I got mad at him when I benched him, and I didn't play him in the league tournament or anything his freshman year. He was one shot shot block away from breaking the all-time Oakland record at that time, which he has since shattered, obviously. And I got mad at him and told him, I'm not going to let you break that record. And I sat his butt down. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get to play in the league tournament. I'm sure it was something very important that happened that, that caused that. Yeah. But <laughs> now, speaking of. Worked uh, out. <laughs> speaking of, uh, we got the NCAA tournament in the final four. You're heading back out there this year? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm heading out Thursday morning to, to New Orleans. Uh, it's worked out perfect for me because, lo and behold, LSU's, everybody knows my son plays football at LSU. Well, their spring football game is Saturday. 
So things I'm just kind of have a way of working yeah, out for amazing. you, don't they? So I'm going to be down in New Orleans for the Final Four. I'm going to rent a car. I'm going to drive to Baton Rouge, and I'm going to get to watch a spring football game. And, and there's a big uh, parent and family thing after the game, and so I'm going to get to meet a lot of the, you know, all his friends down there and his roommates. And then I'm going to get to meet their, his parents, which I've, I never really made it down during the season. My wife did, and my my other kids went down and got to meet all these people, but I haven't. So Saturday is going to be a fun day for me. And I I talked to him. They, they had a scrimmage the other day, and I ask him about it, you know, he redshirted as a freshman, he pretty much played the scout team the whole way. And so the, the spring they're really, you know, they're having scrimmages and going at it. I ask him, you know, he got, he called me, he was all excited, he made his first tackle, you know, and, and uh, I ask him what it felt like and everything and he goes, it's really fast out there. <laughs> you know, the difference between high yeah, school I, I think that's, he, yeah, that's how a lot of people would describe uh, football down there. Yeah. He said, it's really fast. <laughs> so in, in hoops, though, who's, who's your final, or who's your uh, Oh, that's, more, that's what this show's about, hoops? Okay. Well, you know, <laughs> you can brag on your kids a little bit. Oh, uh, yeah, you know. Um, Playing at LSU is kind of a big deal, you know. I'm, I pick Kentucky. Uh, on TV, the day of Selection Sunday, when I was on TV, they asked me, and I picked Kentucky, and I'm sticking with Kentucky. I just, I don't see anybody beat um, I asked a lot of people yesterday, I was out doing a story about the Mega Millions jackpots. 363 million tonight, tickets only a dollar. Are you planning on playing? Oh yeah, I'm in. I'm in because, see, we're going to build a new practice facility when I win that thing. You know, that, that we really need this. You know what, you could probably build two or three. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, I might Separate wanna... one for the men's and the women's team. Yeah, that's what we'll have to do. But, but definitely, if Greg Campy wins the, the uh, Mega Millions tonight, that you will see a brand new practice facility at Oakland University. The one that we've been raising money for and drawing, doing all the drawings and all that kind of stuff, we'll, we'll get that. Probably not going to be that hard to get to and from Utah if you have to go there again, you know, if you hit the Mega Millions. I'm never going to Utah again. Never going to Utah. I'm, it's beautiful, but I'm tired of going up those mountains. All right, Coach, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll let you get out of here. You know, we've got a big off-season ahead. I appreciate the time. Uh, this is your season-ending edition of Grizz Talk. I'm your host, Paul Camp, from theopenpress.com. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate the. We'll see you the, next year. Yeah, appreciate it.